a writer and co-producer for Afro Latinos, The Untaught Story. The first thing I want to say is a statement. Like, we need to lose that term, pero bueno, pero malo. But like, we need to stop using it, period, because, you know, who are we to say what's good and what's bad? I mean, at this point, at this stage in the game, we're all intelligent. We've talked about this issue for many years. We saw it in Chris Rock's movie. Like, like we can't blame it on Trujillo anymore. That's played and tired. We can't blame it on our parents. You know, we're a new generation. We're a new frame of thinking. So, so holding on to that kind of enslaved mentality because we're doing that in 2010, it's time to you know rise to a to a new level. You know, so that's the first thing I want to say um, about me. I came up in the 70s, born in Bushwick, New York, from Dominican parents, and in my house. Although I'm not, I wasn't born in the Dominican Republic, and in the Dominican Republic, I wouldn't be seen as Dominican because it's not my place. In my home, I'm very Dominican, you know, and that was very clear, and I'm very proud of that. Well, also, before I even begin, thank you, Cornell. <laughs> thank you, Cornell. <laughs> Big ups to Yale, NYU, UMass, you know. I'm, Woo! I, I just want to say I'm really proud to see so many Dominicans in the room. I'm sorry? CUNY! CUNY! CUNY. 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 All the universities. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. I, I'm just really proud. But who's counting? But who's counting? <laughs> so thank you guys for having us, and I'm really honored to share this space with the panelists. Um, so growing up in the 70s, there was no Latino, there was no Hispanic. You were either black or you were white, period. And I wasn't dark enough to be black, and I wasn't light enough to be white. So there was always this place, you know, well, actually, it was more of a homeless situation. Like, I didn't have a place. <laughs> like, I don't fit into any box. But if I, had to, if I have to identify myself, I would say I'm Afro-Dominican, I'm a black Latina, I'm Dominican, I'm, I'm all of that, right? So, um, a little personal story. You know, the whole thing about, I've asked a lot of women why they straighten their hair. And they say, it was because it looks good, because I like it, lies. <laughs> lies. There are reasons we do our hair straight. And for me personally, I know it was to look white, to be accepted, to get the job, to be taken seriously because when I walk into a place with my hair curly, they treat me a little differently. You know, she's a little hey, a freak guy, she's a partier, you know, she's not intelligent. However, when I open my mouth and say a word, they're like, oh, wait a minute, let me step back, let me give her you know, let, let me give her an opportunity to see what she's about. And it has all to do with this, you know, what I look like, right? So I have to thank Mark Anthony for bringing the blackness out of me. <laughs> in, the, in the 90s, um, I, I, did, I did everything. I mean, to be white is to be right. So in my house, we know we're Dominican. You marry white to refinar la raza. You know, you marry an up. Yeah. That's what it's about. So I did all the right things. I married the white man. <laughs> I have my half-white daughter who I love. She's white. Um, also went to Capri. Um, so one night, you know, I, I was losing my identity. I was becoming someone that I couldn't, I, I couldn't recognize in the mirror. I didn't speak Spanish in my house. I didn't cook mangu. I didn't make, you know, moro de guandule. I didn't make pernil. I didn't, I didn't cook that. I made pasta, and I was married to an Italian man. Don't, don't, uh, it, don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> That's another topic. <laughs> so, actually, my partner in the documentary is like, Alisa, we need to do a story on you and your upbringing. <laughs> so, so, one night, um, I was going through this identity thing. You know, I was losing my Dominicanness in, in my life in trying to be accepted in society. Right? So, Mark Anthony was getting an award on some show on Univision. And, and he was just talking about, and at that time in the 90s, he wasn't speaking Spanish that well, because he's from New York too, mm -hmm. you know, so we speak gospel English, we try. So he was saying how proud he was to be Puerto Rican and how grateful he was to his dad for teaching him about his roots, his culture, and the music. And in that moment, I just broke down and cried, and I'm like, yo, man, that's who I am. And in that moment, I reclaimed my Dominicanness, and, and unfortunately, that I had to end the marriage too because <laughs> no, because you know I was never going to be white with the straight hair and the blue eyes you know without getting that relaxer and and have that tenaza burning the shit out of me you know? <laughs> so so a little bit about my um, my background my career so 
on this journey to to claim my black roots, because I'm not trying to deny my Euro Spanish <coughs> roots, I'm very proud of that too. But the African root is a very special root for me. When I worked for Business Week magazine, I had a I had a friend, a coworker who had a little bit of beef with me and my daughter, and she knew that I wanted to write for Essence magazine, which is an African American magazine. And she was like, you know, it, it's not your place to write for Essence. Why don't you write for Latina? And I was like, word? <laughs> <laughs> like, really? It's not my place. So that, instead of responding in like this combative way, I really sat back with those words, it's not your place, to try to find out what is my place then. You know, I don't fit in DR, I don't fit in US. Where am I from? Where am I from? What, what, who is Alicia? So it took me, to, it took me on this journey of, of identity, right? And I wrote an article called um, Two Cultures Marching to One Drum, which I pitched to Essence first because, I, as I said, that was my dream magazine, which was called Will the, Will the Real Black Girl Please Stand Up? They rejected me. <laughs> so moving on, Urban Latino <laughs> did publish me. And when that article got published, which was about um, Afro-Latinos in all of Latin America, which, is, you know, are the, which was about the 200 million Afro-descendants that exist today in all of Latin America. <coughs> It's a huge number, you know, when we're trying to deny that we have black in us and Dominicans, we know that we do it. <laughs> so, um, Renzo Davia, the executive producer for the documentary, reached out to, to me and asked me, you know, if I'd like to join him on this journey. He was also on a similar journey, um, talking about this subject, you know, being black in Latin America. And we've been traveling for the past year, two years, through all of Latin America, documenting, investigating, interviewing people about the subject. And it's going to be a seven-part series that we hope comes out in 2011, selling it to either History Channel or National Geographic or Discovery. Mm. So Oof. for that. Um, anyway, I don't want to take up a lot of time because we can talk about a lot of things. But that's, that's me. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Yeah. We had the immigrant experience being born here. I was first generation, nobody knew English, so default, everyone knew Spanish. Um, I have rainbow bright in my family. My mother is, is very light skinned, my father is a little lighter than me, but everyone, all the kids came out every other color but the ones they were coming from their parents. So I never thought anything of it when I was growing up. And when I was younger, yeah, I've always had a lot of hair, more hair than person, as my mom used to say, but it wasn't a major thing for me because it wasn't something that it, you were distinguished by. And in my house, everyone has a different color hair and different hair type. So never was it ever an issue. It's like, I have, if you put like even my first cousins together, none of us look alike. It's very rare that you, oh, you sort of look alike, but we're all very different. And um, so going up, growing up, I was okay being different. I was okay being unique. And as I went on to college, that was like my first culture shock because I went to a predominantly white school. And it was like maybe one Asian girl and me. And then you can count maybe the three <laughs> other minorities in the engineering classes. And going through that was eye-opening for me um, because you were judged. Half the time, people were like, oh, where are you? They thought I was Egyptian half the time or Middle Eastern, um, depending on how I wore my hair that day. So if I decided I needed to blow it out, and then they thought I was either Puerto Rican or Mexican, because those are the only two Latinos yeah. that could be. Or if I decided just to leave my hair wild, they thought I was like, oh, are you Egyptian? Or are you from the Middle East somewhere? So it always, oh, are you mulatto? That's the other thing that they said. Like, I could never just be one thing. I had to be mixed. So after a while, this was annoying. And whatever they asked me, I'm like, yeah. I'm that. I was that for the day because it was just so frustrating, like trying to figure out what people were because then there were more questions. Oh, so then where are you? So when I started working, um, and again, they do ask you for pictures. So I, of course, went to the salon, beautified myself, <laughs> sent in that beautiful picture or whatever. And again, I mean, I've interned in places like NASA and things like that, and, and I've worked in IBM and Bell Labs. So these are people. These are places that are very traditional, very conservative, and now I'm working on Wall Street, so it's like you are running the gamut of conservatism, you know, so they're looking for that suit and, and what have you, and you want to be judged by your brains, not by, oh, there's a, you got a double tick, a minority and a female, oh, we, are, we, we struck it rich here with a smart person with a double diversity tick, um, but I had to prove myself at every single job. Half the time they didn't know what I was. Um, after a while it got annoying. So I got a Dominican flag, put it on my desk. <laughs> they would ask me, where was that? So I started putting a map. 
<laughs> so after a while, it's like, you know, some of the things that they're seeing comes to fruition because when I now that I'm thinking about all of that, I'm like, oh my God, I didn't have to prove myself after all this time. I just had to wear my hair straighter. Okay. But they judge you. They judge your intelligence by your look and what you look like. They take you less seriously. They don't you know, and again, I'm in, a, I'm in a double whammy because not only am I living in that space of, you know, I, I don't have a problem with my identity. I was Dominican. I was always eating. I brought home food from home. I was like, what are you eating? Oh, this is great stuff. That'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, I never had a problem being Dominican or being unique or different because I grew up that way. I was like, D different is good. That's the way to go. And, you know, so having them, they had the problem. That's the way I saw it. I didn't see it that I had one. I felt they did. So, you know, just going through my career and the different places that I've worked, I'm like, all this time, they were judging me on my appearance, not on what I knew or anything. And whenever I spoke, it was just like, oh my God, she makes sense. So she knows what she's talking about. But I'm also working in a man's world. So it, it was like a double whammy. It's just like, oh, now I got to prove myself. I'm not, a, I'm not here because I have a cute smile and I'm female. You know, it's like, I'm here because I have a brain too. So a lot of times when you think about that, you're like, wow, they don't know I'm Dominican or that I'm smart. So they must think I'm really like Dominicans are dumb. And that, I cannot stand when people say dummy in the can or Dominican. Yes. Don't tell me that because I would just, I would just go ballistic. I'm like, People say that. I'm like, no, that's not right. Or, you know, so there was a few jokes about that with you know with a couple of my friends or whatever. But it just made me stand up for who I was even more. It gave that's what gave me strength to say, you know what? No, I'm Dominican. And when people say, and I've gotten some like awards, nationally recognized awards, and in there, I make sure to say from Dominican parents, and sometimes they've left that out, but I know that I purposely say that because at the end of the day, you know, I'm not, I'm not hiding from my heritage. You know, I'm, I'm first generation here, but I make sure that I get involved in projects and things that will always impact not just my community, but also in DR as well. And, and, and that's what it's about. It's just not about oh what your hair looks like or whatever. And at the end of the day, you know what? It's sad that people get judged by, and, and again, I can't. Hide the color of my skin it's not like you know oh yeah let me be white today i can't do that With other people is a little easier to blend in um and when we had to check off those boxes there was no middle boxes if you either black or white i'm black so when i walked in the door they were like wow where are you from it was just like you know it, it's like you can't be black i'm like no i am and then that was the end of the story but some people wanted like an explanation it was just like, no, you, can you speak about it? Or I was just like, uh, no, I, and I, I'm not here for that. I'm here because of the job or whatever. So a lot of times when we look back, um, just in our careers and even in our education, a lot of times it's our own people that hold us back. Um, when I, In my jobs, it's other women that hold you back. And they tear you down and tear you to pieces. Um, I'm like working right now with a co-worker from hell. And, you know, she's an African-American woman. And, you know, it's just my biggest nemesis at work is her so it's just <laughs> amazing and there's few women in technology so it's just like gotta let it go gotta let it go but um again you have to also hold your own and be professional and make sure that you don't you know i don't like to compromise my values my father had you know raised us to be have very strong work ethic you know i'm never late never absent i've gone through school being never late never absent i you know people know that when i'm at work oh sorry i was gonna be here we don't have anything to worry about because they already know that's the type of work ethic I bring to the table. And when I say I'm going to get something done, I get it done. So those are the types of things that you need to focus on. And, you know, you're going to start to change people's perception. But again, it's going to take, it's going to take a lot. It's not going to change overnight. You're still going to have people in the back of your mind. People are always going to start saying that. Um, that whole thing with pelo bueno, pelo malo is in my house it didn't fly too well because it was just like everyone had a different hair type that, you know, people would just say, you know, just comb your hair, you know, or put a hat on or, you know, that kind of thing. So, again, it's education. Um, we had to educate my grandparents. I mean, my grandfather um, did not go to one. Okay, he had a lot of kids. He can choose where he was going to go. But <laughs> one of his kids got married to a Haitian girl. and She was beautiful. She was beautiful. I was just like, oh, my God, is she a model? And she wasn't a model. But let me tell you, that's how this woman was beautiful. My grandfather was didn't go to the wedding because he said that he no kid of his was gonna marry some black girl or whatever. And I was just like, are you freaking kidding me? Well, needless to say that my uncle ended up getting divorced from this woman because of course, family, it impacts that marriage and not everyone survives that. Not everyone survives that. And they ended up getting divorced and now he you know he got married to someone who was Latina and I don't see her as she's nowhere ella no le da lo tobillo. So that's how beautiful it is. And not just on the outside, on the inside. This woman was just, you know, just a beautiful person all around. And I was just amazed when that happened. And that was in my adult life that I was like, holy crap. 
like our grandparents are amazing people like whoa so i started changing you know my grandmother and educating her because i only had power over her because she lived with me in my house so again a education process and i think a lot of um you know what the research is coming out and i think some of the things that they'll find we need to be those ambassadors and go back and start educating our parents or re-educating our parents thinking um, because in all honesty it's not going to change overnight and you're going to be running into things and some of us have to do certain things to survive in this world and I don't think compromising our values is one of them or who we are so thank you. The 80s and I was born and raised in the Bronx. I'm in Albany now and I am moving back down state this summer. Uh, for 19 years of my life I hated the fact that I was black and I also relaxed my hair from the age of 6 till the age of 18. I almost did not take black study classes in college because I thought that black people were unsophisticated people that I didn't need to be in a classroom with. Mm. I no longer feel that way, but that's how I felt for most of my life. I cut my hair off December 17, 2004, um, and have been rocking my natural hair ever since. And from that point on, I made it my business to research why. Why do we straighten our hair? Why do we even have the hair that we have? I'm going to speak briefly on some research I did. I recently wrote and published a book called The Enemy Madre, which I speak about in depth, my self-hatred and self-love, and research about um, being African, Afro-Latina, and um, hair in particular. Um, our hair has purpose. We don't just have arbitrarily curly hair just for, for shits and giggles. <laughs> um, hair is made out of keratin, which is a hard fiber. Um, it protects your hair, it shields your hair from the sun and protects it and cools it off. Now, African hair, the way that it is structured in curls, that was an uh, adaptation for sub-Saharan heat for our heads not to get sunburned. The curls, our curls contain, um, hold and contain our sweat so that our hair, our head cools off and also the kinks in it um, break break down the UV, the UV light so that we don't get that direct sunburn and that direct um, damage onto our scalps. It's not just because I'm just going to rock it because black power, no. This actually is protecting my hair and also <laughs> if I were to for some reason get a blow to my head, this cushion. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Um, before our ancestors were brought over to this country, um, hair defined status, who you were married to, what you believed in, um, who, like, um, everything and anything you could possibly think that hair defined, that's what it did. Um, especially where, um, for mo most of our ancestors come from um, the West, West? Yeah. West Africa. Um, in the Mendy tribe, the term kipoto means a um, plentiful woman, which um, having an afro was seen as being plentiful and, and fertile and connected our spirit to um, the, the concept of Mother Earth. Um, when we got to this country, as um, she mentioned about uh, economics and beauty standards and all that, First thing they went after was our hair. We didn't have time to fix our hair. We were out on the field for 16 hours. The last thing we thought about was, what am I gonna do with my hair? You wanna go to sleep. So we wore, we wore rags on our heads and that would damage our hair. And we saw that our other light-skinned light brethren that were on the plantations got better opportunities while they were straightening their hair. The first crude, crude instruments for straightening hair were um, bacon grease and, a, and, and a, like a butter knife. And, all, and then we moved on to the Hisado. Now, how many of you guys have seen Fight Club? You know that part in, in Fight Club when, um, what's his name, the soap? Edward Norton and Brad Pitt, they're in the kitchen and he burns the crap out of his hand? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's lye. Lye is found in almost every single uh, cleaning agent in your house. Yeah. Your oven cleaner, biodiesel, you name it, lye probably has it. It is also in the Hisado. That's made out of sodium, sodium hydroxide. FDA has said that it is unhealthy for you to inhale that. Imagine how many Dominican hairdressers inhale that every single day. Mm -hmm. Why are you putting that on your hair? And I'm not 
up here asking you, go outside after this workshop and cut your hair off like I did, and my mom freaked out. She was like, hi, this was some decent, oh my god. <laughs> Not every day, the woman walked out of her bathroom with, a, with no hair, but <laughs> yo, I went in. Brittany. <laughs> Brittany style? Um, I'm not here to convince anybody to walk out of this workshop and cut your hair off. That's something that I had to do for myself. But ask yourself, seriously, why? Why do you shaving your hair? It could be for any reason, but ask yourself and know that reason. And not only hair, but everything you do, wear, and say is a statement. If you walk around in a polyester suit with your tie and whatnot, you're making a statement that you conform to some, some kind of what, whatever it is. I walk around with this, afro, with this afro pick, I make a statement every single moment that somebody sees this. So, go, going back to, um, to our ancestors, they believed that your spirit was nestled in your hair. That that was the closest part to, to the divine. And that's why they took such good care of it. So, think about that. When you're doing whatever it is you're doing to your hair or to your body, it is an extension of your godliness or whatever religion you practice. <coughs> it's not an arbitrary, I'm just gonna straighten it because I wanna look like X, Y, and Z. Um, and, Okay. Right? And I think that says a lot. It's not based on judgment, but I think and I, I think it comes with age. I'm 28 years old and I think that when I was 21, I would have been in here with my repeat suit and my tacos with my bunions hurting. <laughs> that was what that was what I felt was right. professional and acceptable. Mm -hmm. But when you grow into, you grow out of like your old self that your parents informed and you realize that your own person, you realize like people are gonna like accept me the way I come. But if I choose to like change myself so that you can accept me and eventually say, but well, once I get my foot in the door, I'm gonna change the game, what happens? Let me get my right foot in the door and I'm gonna change the game. Let me get my arm in the door and I'm gonna change the game. I'm 75 years old and I'm like, I'm too tired to change the game. <laughs> <laughs> Being in academia and being professors, a lot of black and Latino professors do that. I'm going to write this bullshit article to get tenure. And then they get tenure, which means you get like, you can't, you yeah. get like, you can't get fired. You can't get fired. You're untouchable. And then they're like, well, let me write this book and then I'm going I'm to start the revolution and get cat. <laughs> and then it's like, they get the book and it's ambition. I think this is what the sister was saying. The system is built for for like not the ambition that was spoken about in the other panel that Dominicans have organically because we were enslaved, our indigenous and African ancestors at least, and we've had to survive. It's a European, like Eurocentric ambition where there's never enough, there's never enough. So there's, it's, it's very rare that people get into the game. JLo is one of like 70 million people that made it into the game and are changing it. And I'm not discouraging anybody, but y'all are relatively young and understand that like, this whole idea of like, let's change the game is very important. You're very like on point where we're in a matrix. This is how I see it. And we can't be like the rosters living in the woods, eating like yams, right. like removing ourselves completely from the system. So you gotta dance to the master's tunes to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But if you say I'm a dance and then I'm gonna go and play bachata when they let me in, they're gonna be like, and like X and like Martin Luther King and like Gandhi, they will kill you physically if you really challenge the system. So I ask ya, beyond the whole hair thing, like really be careful with the way you try to be strategic in this game because especially in finance, they will eat away at your soul. And I've seen brothers who are like 35 with like a head of gray hair and they're too tired to be like the revolutionary leader. So. I want to comment on what you said about um, conforming. I. How many of you guys listen to have listened to Immortal Technique at any point? There's a line in one of his songs, it's not the system only. If you won't change the system, it's the system that will eventually change you. Um, I think that going back to just appearance and to like the, the topic of this discussion, um, you're enslaved straight off the back by everything you buy, everything you do to your body, and everything you do or say. Like, most of us are preoccupied with getting that money and getting that paper. Fine, I'm not hating on you. We all need to pay our bills or whatever the case may be, but you continually, all right, so now I'm paying my bills, now I have to get that BMW. Now I have to go straighten my hair, I gotta go do my nails, I gotta go get that suit. Little by little, you are buying into the game, but you're losing parts of yourself. 
like no, none of us up here are like you know shave your head and go start the revolution tomorrow <laughs> no like that's not how it's gonna go down but start to ask yourself those questions that's where the revolution starts where you start asking yourself why do I have 20 20 persons in my, in my bag in, in my closet why do I have tons of shoes why am I going every single Saturday religiously to go straighten my hair who am I trying to impress why am I still a slave to this hair dryer or this hair or this blower? Why do I need 20 chains? Why do I need to be tough? Or whatever the case may be, like define it for yourself. Who are you really beneath all that makeup, beneath all that straight hair? Like we we can talk for ages about revolution and conforming and system. Nah, we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing for our communities? Why do we need power and money? Because honestly, to be real straight with you, this system is not sustainable. We cannot keep robbing from the earth and from each other if we want to get somewhere. So I, if you want to go ahead and do the finance thing, do your thing. But I'm letting you know that that's not where our power lies. Our power lies within ourselves and within each other. So we need to cut the crap and ask yourself, for real, why do I need acrylic nails that's going to damage my nails? 20, 20 years down the road and I can't wear my hair, my nails natural. Why is it that most people that get a relaxer start losing their hair? You're damaging yourself. Like, forget all, forget all of, like the, the, the bling and all that. Ask yourself <coughs> questions. When you find the answer that if in reality, yeah, you want to straighten your hair for X, Y, and Z reason, at least you can go to sleep at the end of the night knowing you know why you do what you do. Yo creo que tenemos nosotros que investigar. Yo soy puertorriqueño, no soy dominicano. Pero he trabajado con miles de estudiantes este, dominicanos. Y de hecho, muchos trabajaban para mí antes de retirarme de la Universidad de Massachusetts. Yo recluté estudiantes de, de New York, que yo no sé ni de qué sitio son. De Washington. Eh, de varios sitios allá en Nueva York. Y son amigos míos, todavía nos comunicamos en Facebook, el tiempo que yo tengo ahora después de retirado. Que trabajo más que cuando trabajaba. Pero yo creo que tenemos que regresar a lo que ustedes estaban diciendo antes, porque aún después que ustedes comentaron que el término pelo bueno, pelo malo, no es que no se debe usar, es que no se puede utilizar en público, ¿entiendes? Ni en ningún sitio, ni en la mente de nosotros decir, este tiene el pelo malo, yo lo tengo bueno, aquel lo tiene un poquito más malo que el otro. <risa> Eso ya hay que eliminarlo. Hay que decírselo a los niños, a lo mejor ustedes no tienen hijos, ni Dios quiera que tengan muchos, porque es un problema. Yo fui un padre soltero, me casé con mi esposa después, los criamos juntos. Pero lo más difícil hoy día es criar hijos. Y con, lo, y con estos problemas que estamos teniendo, especialmente esta cuestión de racismo, que es lo que nosotros como latinos... En Puerto Rico existe mucho racismo y en la República Dominicana existe racismo. No, 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 Ahora mismo, desde que usted sale de este cuarto, si no aprendió con ese panel que está ahí, debe volver a leer, a educarse y a reeducarse y a pensar que si va a tener hijos, que eso no puede pasar. Ok, déjenme decirle lo último, que yo sé que quieren que me calle ya. Mira, mira, le invito a Isante. Buenas voz. En Puerto Rico, obvio, sí. Tenía una familia de nueve, muy buena. Right? So, algunos eran como yo. Otros eran unas indias, las hermanas mías son como indias con el pelo indio, como mi esposa color un poquito más trigueñito, uno más blanco, pero salió uno negro. Y le decían pan quemado. No. Y cada vez que él venía llorando a casa, nosotros íbamos los nueve a pelear. Y hasta el día de hoy, siempre nosotros nos recordamos de eso. Mira, a este le decían pan quemado. Y él salió con el pelo más liso, no sé por qué. Eh, mi abuelo, mi abuelo, yo tenía una abuela negra y tenía unos abuelos indios, unos que ni los conocí, ¿entiendes? Pero que te digo, vuelvo y repito, desde este momento, 
este taller que le han dado a ustedes, yo les recomiendo, como más viejo que son que ustedes, pues, de de muchos de ustedes. Mi hija tiene 37 años. Y les pido por favor que salgan de aquí con eso, que eso no existe. Y ya, porque si no es un racismo que estamos acusando, yo acusé siempre cuando era estudiante en la Universidad de Massachusetts cogiendo edificios, peleando uh. abriendo espacio para que los estudiantes dominicanos y puertorriqueños en particular que ingresaran a la universidad y se graduaran etcétera, etcétera, ¿entiendes? y luchamos contra esos autos, esos son unos racistas y eso era siempre lo que usábamos ahora, nosotros podemos acusarnos nosotros mismos de racistas, o lo dejamos o eso nos va a perjudicar especialmente ustedes si piensan tener hijos Muchas gracias. Why does your hair move? You know, that, that was a big deal. You know, and <laughs> it was. It was a big deal, you know. And the pulling of my hair, and uh, you know, just because to them there was a difference between us, despite the fact that we were first cousins. Okay? When you raise a child, I know because I have two cousins right now. When you raise a child, okay, and you start from the beginning, and you tell them, like you were saying, my cousin was told, because she was the darkest one, le llamaban la, le llamaban la fea. She was la fea. Out of six kids. Yeah, but it's reality. Because it happens today. Okay, I've worked in New York, I've worked in Jersey, I've worked in many states. And it happens now. And if we, it does take a village. Yeah. And we have stopped using our village. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? There used to be a time when somebody said something and your tia or your, your next door neighbor saw it. Mira, mira, coño, que tu haces? Mm -hmm. Go to your mother, tell your mother. Your mother said, hey, the adult said you did this, you did it. Nowadays, we're losing that. We're losing community. We're losing our groundedness in who we are. Yeah. I suggest we reclaim it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Start yes. today. Um, but you can change yourself. Mm -hmm. And the change begins with you, not with the work. Cada quien tiene que poner su granito de arena. Estamos aquí todos para cumplir una misión. ¿Cuál es la misión que yo estoy cumpliendo? hear all of this and do all of that and there's a lot of people that go back and never take any of that information never change um and a lot of it also has to do with you know your family what you grow up with that's something you can never escape no matter how hard you want to try if your parents don't like dark people they're not gonna ever Like, so you can change, because it's possible. You can be 90 years old and change your perspectives, but it's really hard. I mean, you grow up with this mentality of, you know, it, being Dominican, you know, Haitianos, Haitians, they, you know, oh, no, 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 they're bad people, this and that, isn't that. No, there's bad people everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it's all around. And I think a lot of the, a lot that we have to work at as Latinos, not just Dominicans, is being able to uplift ourselves. I mean, Latinos are all divided. People can say, you know, we're beginning to be more, no, you're not. <laughs> Because it's the truth, it's, you know, we're here, this is the Dominican conference, this is us trying to unite ourselves. I mean, that's enough said. I mean, we have to work and more uniting all Latino countries and, and being able to take all our differences and put them together because if we don't do that this is going to continue being a white man's world this is going to continue being dominated by men you know women a lot of women i've seen this and a lot of women don't think that they can do something oh um no, i i clean the house and i you know for my husband because he works and does this and does that but i mean Who cares? I, if you don't do anything for yourself, you're just gonna be seen as the other part of that person. You're you're a human being yourself. I mean, you need to work on yourself. Mm, But I think fact, you also, this, this is goes to the point of, you know, the two panelists on that end have been doing research, right? We also have to know our history. It's like what they're saying, yeah. because a lot of this is not just that people hate people. No, no, we're talking about, if you go generations back, 
Haitians truly hated Dominicans for what the Dominicans were doing to their people. But then you look a few years later, then the Dominicans were hating the Haitians for what they were doing to their people. Because, you know, everyone was invading everybody. Everybody was going into each other's countries. And even now, when you start looking at some of these documentaries on the Bates and DR, I mean, atrocious humanity, you know, lack of just, you know, just human beingness is going on today. So when you start looking at things like that, that's where a lot of these feelings of, of hatred and things like that are born from. And when you look at even the Middle East, when you go to some of these uncensored websites and things like that, look at these six, seven-year-olds with machine guns whispering and talking about such hatred and such, and they don't care about life. And they, you have generations living with that hatred of, of that life isn't even important. When you start looking at that, that gives you a wake-up call that, you know what, we're living in a world where you could be dealing with somebody that can care less about whether you live or die because they don't even care about themselves. So that's why it's very important to definitely do your research and know some of that history because it'll help you to educate. It's, it's a re-education and it's a rethinking and you know what, it's not going to be easy and it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. But if everyone does their little granito de arena and brings it to the table, that's when we're going to start seeing not a major revolution, but you know, a revolution enough to bring humanity back because I think we've lost humanity 